led by the triumvirate of First Lady Eleanor Roosevelt, Secretary of Labor Frances Perkins, the first woman to serve in the cabinet, and Molly Dusen, head of the Women's Division of the Democratic National Committee, a women's network of high-level appointees influenced the social welfare policies of the New Deal, especially in the Works Progress Administration and the Social Security Administration. Women also took on larger roles in the revitalized Democratic Party. Even though the results were far from achieving gender parity, Women's interests and issues might have been overlooked if not completely forgotten in the 1930s without the effective mobilization of the women's network. So the New Deal, I think, truly was a breakthrough for women in public life. Now many of these women were firsts in, uh, whose appointments were widely reported in the press, but unfortunately it proved difficult to institutionalize their progress. Women found many fewer opportunities during wartime in the 1940s than they had in the depression of the 1930s. And reminding those in positions of power that women could serve with distinction at the very highest levels of politics and government remained an uphill battle. Indeed, it still remains one today. And without an Eleanor Roosevelt or a Molly Dusen to constantly press women's case, too often the jobs defaulted back to white men. But a major reason, I think, to remember the contributions that women made to the New Deal is to situate the story of women wielding power as part of a much lar longer continuum that stretches from the women's suffrage movement, actually from before the women's <laughs> suffrage movement, through the New Deal all the way to the 2018 elections and beyond. Women have always wielded political power, but where and how and which women have changed over time. And as we assess where women are today and where they might be heading, we should always remember that they are standing on the shoulders of the political women who came before. <laughs>